Welcome, everybody. We're so happy that you've joined us today for the, um, new, the monthly New Hampshire Parent Connect meeting on the exciting topic of ad adaptive techniques for teaching and making art. We are so excited that we have um, Sarah Coltair as the manager of school tours and youth programs of the Courier Museum of Art in Manchester that will be presenting to us. Um, we, I want to thank um, uh, Future Insight for their generous contribution to support New Hampshire Parent Connect to have monthly informational and support group meetings for families of blind and visually impaired kids and that they recognize the significance importance of that. So thank you so much for the effort. It's not just to be the Zoom meeting, but all everything that goes behind it with the support to make it happen. So thank you so much. I appreciate it. Um, my name is Susan Laventure. I'm a, a parent of a visually impaired child who, um, who is now much older, but when he was first diagnosed while I was living in New Hampshire, I was so devastated when he had uh, was born with a rare eye cancer uh, when he was a baby. And I was just really wanting to connect with other parents and support services. And um, I was able to connect with the New Hampshire Association for the Blind at the time, now Future Insight, and um, was able to work very well with them. I've actually spent the past 30 years in building and support programs for parents of blind children nationally and internationally since then. And um, been back now back to home and working with New uh, Future Insight. And here we are today um, to continue to provide support and information to families. Um, I'd like to introduce Sherry would you like to tell them about you? Your Cherry is a director of youth services at Future Insight. Please let us know about you. Thanks, Susan. Uh, yes, I am uh, the director of youth services. I oversee uh, school services, uh, and we are looking forward to expanding our youth services. Uh, we have a small uh, activity, uh, small but busy activity. Um, program that happens on Saturdays. Uh, and we're looking uh, forward to expanding into more community participation uh, once communities are open again for folks to get together. Uh, and in the meantime, we have um, some online um, gatherings that happen on Saturdays uh, for students to get together um, and do activities. Fantastic. So I'm really excited about the opportunity for uh, Future Insight, New Hampshire Association for the Blind and the Courier Museum of Art to collaborate together on this issue. I think it's critically important for parents and families to understand how accessibility, like because your child's blind doesn't mean that they can't do art, you know, and, um, and to open up this conversation and to explore together. And we have, we are so fortunate to have Sarah Coltaire this evening, who is the uh, manager of school tours and youth programs at the Curry Museum of Art in Manchester. And uh, for her to um, present to us her ideas and her expertise, and for us to continue to work together to make sure that kids and families get involved with art. Awesome. Sarah, you want to start? <laughs> I will. Thank you, Susan. Thanks, Sherry. Um, I'm very excited to be here. I, um, I'm so happy to engage with people in any way during this time. So um, virtually or in person always makes me excited. Um, like uh, Susan said, I'm the manager of school tours and youth programs. So um, at The Courier, I handle school tours and youth programming, which is a wide range of family programs, story times, all sorts of things that I'll get into in just a moment. But like Susan said, um, art is accessible on all levels. And um, although there are boundaries and, and um, barriers sometimes to accessing that, um, it's important to, in my work and then also in the museum we work in to make sure that um, the museum and making art as well is as accessible um, as possible for um, students who are 
visually impaired or, or blind or have low vision. And so I'm going to talk about um, a few things. I'll talk about the museum itself to give you a little background and then um, talk about looking or, or experiencing art is a better way to say it. And then also um, making art in the different ways that um, we can engage with that. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Hopefully all goes well. <laughs> I always feel like I have something. Yeah go wrong <laughs> when I try to do a slideshow. All right. Everybody can see the screen there. Okay. That's all a beautiful right. clear shot. <laughs> it is a nice, I love this picture. I use this picture on all my fancy presentations. <laughs> so um, right now we're looking at a picture of the outside of the courier, um, which is located in downtown Manchester. Um, it is, has been around for almost 100 years. We um, were established, um, yeah, basically almost 100 years in 1921, um, right after crash. Um, but we have been around, um, we were started by Moody Courier, who used to be the governor um, prior to establishing um, this art museum of his collection of works, and it has since expanded. Um, we have thousands of works of art from European, um, from the Renaissance time, to contemporary, to um, exhibitions. Currently over the summer we'll have an exhibition where a living artist is going to come and create art. So uh, we are a small but mighty um, in the wonderful state of New Hampshire, and it's, um, it's the, one of the most prominent art museums in the state um, and also in the region. So we're very proud of the work we do um, in Manchester. And we are actually, I should note, the museum itself has been closed since December, um, obviously due to COVID and the rise in cases, um, but we are reopening on April 1st. So you can come back. It's not an April Fool's joke. We are opening on April 1st. So. <laughs> Yay. Feel free to come in. We are very excited to welcome people um, back into the museum after our doors have been closed for a little bit. Um, just to give some background on the museum itself, our mission, we are focused on art. Obviously, we are an art museum, um, but that doesn't mean we're just looking or talking about art or, or experiencing the space with it. We're also focused on people making art. So that means we are centered in community. Uh, we want to make sure that all um, citizens and, and residents of Manchester, of Southern New Hampshire, of all New Hampshire, of the greater Boston, New England area, um, get to come to this museum and feel at home. Um, sometimes museums can be intimidating because of the kind of structure and, and rules and, and ways you need to move about them. But um, my personal philosophy is that museums should be a space of comfort and to get to feel more at home with yourself. So that's the way that I look at it. And I think that resonates with our mission statement as well. And we're committed to inspire. So my goal um, in the work that I do and, and the goal of the education team is to, although get you to learn more about art, um, like this beautiful painting by um, Jan de Bry, um, but we also want people to be inspired to make their own art and feel comfortable doing that and feel like they have um, just enough tools to do it. You don't have to be an expert. I am not an expert in art. Um, my my um, education is more about talking about um, content in informal ways and having comfortable conversations about bigger, bigger things. So let's think about it. Um, so moving on, uh, a few things to think about before you maybe come to the museum. You can come to visit. Um, we're open Thursdays through Sundays, um, 10 to 5. Um, so feel free to drop in anytime you'd like after April 1st. Um, but we also have a bunch of other things besides just being an art museum where you can come and visit. Um, we have an art center where we teach classes from drawing to painting to ceramics to bookmaking. Um, we offer school tours, which is what I do, um, for kindergarten to university students. So around the state, um, typically in fourth grade, you're taught New Hampshire history. So we have a lot of New Hampshire fourth graders come through our doors, um, and virtually come through our doors, uh, to the museum to learn about New Hampshire history, but then also different, um, university classes based in Manchester as well. Um, we have many family programs, two that I can highlight. Um, that I lead are our creative studio program, which is actually every second Saturday of the month. It is free. Um, and when we reopen, that also includes free admission 
to the museum, which um, I always like to highlight. Um, we then, right now we're currently offering art making supplies and then um, instructions both uh, written and um, through video where we guide families, they can pick up their art kits and then come back to their homes and make their own wonderful masterpieces. I'm actually gonna share a lesson today. Um, they'll be able to be um, sent off if you'd like to the one that's happening this Saturday, but the next one will be happening in the second week of April if you'd like to sign up. Um, we also do a story time. I do a story time every week um, online currently um, where I read different books relating to art, subjects about art. Um, this past month, I did a lot of self-care books. We all need some self-care right now. Um, so you can find those online at our website. Um, I have made many over the past year and it's been a highlight because I really enjoy reading children's books. Um, they are a lot of fun. We also have a bunch of outreach programs that we do. Um, we work with the Center for New Americans. We have, uh, we work with INTI and we also have a program called Making Art Accessible, which is for um, adults and teen um, students who have developmental and intellectual disabilities um, to give them the opportunity to really engage with art on a substantial level. Um, some of our newest programs include veterans programs. Um, we have received a grant through the state to um, expand our opportunities working with um, veterans, either families of veterans or veterans themselves. Um, art I find is very healing um, and a great way to express ourselves. And um, through feedback, we found that these programs have been really successful. So I'm very proud of that. That's awesome. But let's get to the heart of why we're here. <laughs> um, so as parents of, of children who have um, low vision or, or blind, um, I think probably, and this is for my own understanding, is I think coming to a museum can also can sometimes be intimidating. It's not always um, the most accessible space. Uh, art is often a visual medium. Um, so how do you engage with your child in a museum and it make it an exciting and comfortable experience. So I wanted to offer a few tips or advice. Um, and I'm also, I'm really excited to hear questions if people want to send them my way. I'm happy to, um, to hear feedback because we're always looking to, to become a more accessible and responsive museum. So um, these are some things that I've thought about um, and, and learned over my time. Um, I think when you come to a museum, a conversation is something that doesn't always happen um, with people. You walk into the space and you're like, I'm just supposed to look, I'm not supposed to be talkative, but uh, we at The Courier want you to have conversations about the art and especially um, focusing on your child's experience. Obviously you are there to have a wonderful time with them, um, but you are acting as a guide and a friend to them in this experience where you can stop and talk about pieces. Um, visual descriptions obviously are incredibly helpful and I'll touch upon that in a, in a few, but we want you to have conversations about the pieces that you're looking at or the spaces you're experiencing. So you could walk into a gallery and see this very large Joan Mitchell piece that has all these colors splattered around, very similar to Jackson Pollock of the spat splatter drawings. Um, you can maybe offer a description, or if your child ha is, has low vision, you can invite them to step closer. Um, and I really like to center art around the emotions and the way that I feel in a space. Um, not necessarily I know one thing or another, like I know when this happened, when this was painted or how it was painted, but talking about um, the more emotional sensory experience. So emotional, like this looks very... Um, with all this color and splatter, it looks very messy and I feel confused and it feels um, frustrating. And I feel like this person maybe is trying to say something but I don't know what they're trying to say. Um, I always like to highlight that there's no wrong answer with art. So there's that's something to approach this experience with too. And then also thinking about sensory. Um, I wish we could all touch the paintings. I would love to touch the paintings. You usually can't do that in a museum. Some museums are doing better with that where they're offering experiences like that. Um, but talking about the texture, instead of thinking just with your, your eyes, what would the touch feel like? Would it feel bumpy? Would it feel smooth if you're looking at a statue? How would it feel under your hands? Would it be maybe cold if it's made of stone? Would it feel rough if it was had wood on it? Um, so offering different, examples of what how to experience art it doesn't need to just be 
um, visual. I also like the museum as a exploring art space because it's usually, it can also be quiet and reflective. We live very busy and hectic lives right now, um, but coming into a museum can be a space where you can um, sit and be meditative and reflective. So I find that to be a good space for parents and children together. You usually can find maybe a moment of silence together um, and also be able to talk about maybe not just the art, but what's going on in your life um, in a space that's new, but also usually pretty calming. Um, most museums offer audio tours. We at The Courier offer a wonderful audio, audio tour that's um, done by our staff and is really reflective of the art that we're looking at um, in a very approachable and personal way. Um, so I'd recommend asking at the front desk about audio tours. It's a great way to provide more context and information about a piece um, without being bit visual information. Um, and then also at museums, we often offer tactile spaces where you can touch items um, that give you a better understanding of art. So if we're talking about a Georgia O'Keeffe piece that maybe has a skull in it, um, we have a fake animal skull in our discovery gallery. So you can get a better understanding of what this painting is representing. Um, so often places have that. You can sometimes ask at the courier, we have a dedicated tactile space for children to, of all um, accessibility levels, be able to engage with that. So that's just some ways to think about exploring art. I think um, our immediate thoughts again go to visual, but there are different ways to experience art um, in these spaces. All right, now thinking about making art. This is where I really like, my, my favorite part of my job is making art and being with people making art. Um, I don't think you have to be an expert. I don't think you have to have any previous knowledge to make art. Everybody can make art if you're a parent or you're a kid. Um, it's all up to you because it's your piece of art and there's nothing. There's no right way to do it. So a few adaptations that I have found helpful in my teaching, um, and I've heard feedback from people that this is usually helpful for children with low vision who might still have um, some contrast and ability to, to see. Um, so I always, this is a, a tactic I always use with with all children is just making sure you share a finished example before you begin a project. So maybe you're going to be making um, an, a lesson I'll share at the end of this is making sculpted flowers with model magic, which is similar to clay, but a much more approachable material. You can find it at CVS or Walmart or Target. Um, and it's usually like a dollar. Um, and instead of clay, you just use that and it dries very quickly. So you would want, probably want to make one or show um, a picture if it's um, accessible um, to just give an idea of what you're going to be making so they can kind of direct their thoughts towards that. They can make it however they want, but just to give them an idea of where the materials they're going to be using are going to go. Um, another important thing, again, with any child when you're making art, usually it's helpful to lay out all the uh, materials beforehand. So I would lay out my pipe cleaners, my model magic, my markers, and maybe physically touch all of them to get an understanding of what you're going to be working with prior to starting the project. Um, these are projects that I do at home or that I do in the classroom. So these are things that are always available to you um, in your homes. So another thing that I do, this is different than the lesson that I was just talking about, but um, drawing activities, if you're just sketching, say you're gonna color in a pumpkin, it's Halloween, you wanna color in a pumpkin, providing an outline and like a dark marker on contrast to like a white paper is helpful to give an idea of what the object is um, and kind of a way to draw within the lines, um, either literally or figuratively. Um, so just having those materials ready. Also another good thing, this is, I, my papers fly off the table as well, is if you lose, if you, you lose your paper while you're drawing, um, having a placemat underneath to secure the paper and the materials. So it's steady right in front of you is always good. I recommend plastic, sometimes fabric ones aren't that great. So like a flat plastic one that you can, again, find at Walmart or Target. I'm giving plugs to Walmart and Target this evening, but they are very helpful. Um, does anybody have any questions? I don't want to keep talking if anybody had any questions so far. No, it sounds great. Sounds good. Unless you, Sherry, do you have any questions?
I think those are all great, really um, easy ideas to um, get people started, mm -hmm. even at home. Yeah, exactly. I think um, you don't have to become an expert. There's it's there's simple simple ways to make this um, more approachable and building on that once you get those first few steps in. All right. Um, so this is, again, this can be scaffolded. You can build upon the things I just touched on. Um, these are also helpful tips. This is more for um, students or children who need, who have really no usable vision, um, but obviously are, are still making art. Um, so what I found helpful um, with children I've worked with before is um, look, looking with your hands, which I know we do um, pretty consistently with um, blind and low vision children, but getting understanding of the materials that you're working with. Oftentimes in art class, um, in a school, you might be working with um, materials that you've never worked with before. So offering a tactile understanding of what you're going to have to manipulate and touch and use um, is usually the best way to start. Um, just giving, and then giving a layout of what, the, again, like laying out all the materials, this gives them a familiarity with what they're going to have to be working with. Um, locating landmarks also with visual description. So um, thinking about the flower bouquet that I was just talking about, you use pipe cleaners and model magic. The pipe cleaners are the stem, the model magic becomes the petals, um, and then you color the petals to give them whatever beautiful color you want to. But figuring out those landmarks beforehand, so like the top and bottom where you're gonna make your flower on the um, pipe cleaner, how you're gonna make the petals. So kind of giving landmarks for each step um, with verbal description is also helpful. Um, I found this helpful with drawing again. I know not everybody's gonna be sculpting or using 3D materials. Drawing is usually a very quick um, way to make art, but putting a mesh screen or sandpaper under the paper to get a tactile feeling of drawing. Um, I Even I like that experience because it gives me more to, to base what I'm doing underneath. Um, and then also tactual borders. So like information lines, if you're working with maybe a younger student who's still learning shapes, um, like circles and squares. Um, I grew up using wiki sticks, which are those kind of wax um, sticks that you can bend and mold. But I have laid them out on paper before into different shapes and had students practice um, drawing those shapes if they're still younger and still developing um, motor skills as well, which I find really helpful. And you can use different items. It doesn't have to be wiki sticks. It can be more substantial things like a pen you can establish as like a line, a straight line. Um, you can use cookie cutters for circles, but just giving an example of what kinds of shapes, again, for probably a younger student, um, but a way to, to keep their um, attention on a specific thing and then building out from there. All right. So making art isn't just about making. Um, we're also learning a lot when we make art, um, specifically cognitive skills and fine motor skills. Um, again, this is probably experiences for maybe younger students, but again, always helpful to think about these things. Even when you're talking about art, um, I mentioned texture and um, different ways to think about art. And this is a helpful way to do that is establishing um, the um, textural experience of objects and then talking about them when you see them on a wall so um, or experience them. So I would say discussing likes and differences and textures of art materials. Um, I love a good recycled bag where you just kind of take things from your house and put them in there that you could use to make art. Um, a lot of art is reused materials. So you can have feathers in there, you could have sticky things, you could have soft things, you can have plush things, you can have hard things, kind of to give an idea of what different art materials are like. Um, the thickness and thinness of materials, um, matching materials with the same texture, uh, discuss if art materials are hard or soft, rough or smooth, um, and then also discuss shapes of materials because you can feel along the lines of what, what does this feel like in my hands? What does a circle feel like? What does a square feel like? Um, so then give a cognitive understanding of those shapes. Um, I guess this is one of the last parts and then we can open up for any questions, but um, I think one of the best things about art is uh, developing fine motor skills. Um, this again is all 
scaffolded, you all kind of build on this over time. Um, with younger ones, maybe um, using finger painting to promote finger sensitivity. I still really like finger painting. It's really fun. Um, you can experience paint in a very exciting way instead of having to hold a brush or another tool. Um, you get to understand the way that paint moves. Um, it doesn't move like water, it moves differently. It has, it's more solid. Um, so how do you control that? And using your fingers is a great way to understand how to do that. Um, also other materials um, for tactual discrimination to develop understanding of what these things feel like. So Play-Doh is a great one to think about if you were sculpting something. Um, water in a way is like paint, I just said, but not exactly, but still the understanding of how it flows and how you can control watercolors like that. Um, and then elastic bands also just for the stretchiness of either canvas or things like that to again, feel out how these um, relate to art materials. I really enjoy model magic. It's one of my favorites. Um, you can squeeze and mold clay for hand strength to kind of develop that. Um, I, when I'm working with children with um, low vision or, or impaired vision, I usually do projects that are more tactile. And I, I typically don't always do drawing, I have, but um, it's a way to engage more parts of the brain and really think about the project as well. It's not, it's 3D. I prefer 3D art. That's my favorite type of art. Um, and really get an understanding of the physical sense of what you're making. Um, and then also tearing and cutting paper. This is a, a skill that's we, I think, overlook sometimes, but it's developed at a young age and over time as well. So giving your, your child or student the ability to feel comfortable either using scissors. Um, there's a lot of great scissors and I can recommend them or just tearing it up into pieces as well. So those are just my recommendations. Um, obviously I could talk a lot more about what I do and, and how you can create art and experience art as well. Um, but I'm just so glad to be here and, and make this connection and hopefully build this partnership even more. So thank you for letting me speak. I guess if there are any questions, I'm happy to take them.